Hi, and welcome to Faith, Art, and Tiny Houses. I'm your host, Carmen Shank. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we're going to be speaking with David Latimer of New Frontier Tiny Homes. This is an interview I did some time ago for the Tiny House Virtual Summit called Simplify My Dot Life. Instead of dot com, it's dot life. So welcome, David. First, tell me about designing a beautiful upper end tiny home. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I kind of stumbled into the luxury market. Am I... Uh, it kind of goes hand in hand, the, the whole design thing. Um, it's kind of, there's not like a clear, clear path uh, to how I got to my aesthetic and all those things. It's kind of, I chose a life of experience after college. Um, mm -hmm. I stayed literature. Well, sorry to interrupt you, but tell me about your uh, education. I, th I think you had, I don't remember what your degrees were, but they're kind of unusual if I remember right. Yeah, yeah sure. So, so I, uh, <laughs> I actually paid for school with a football scholarship, believe it or not. Really? Okay. Um, yeah, I went to a, a small liberal arts school, uh, Division One, but um, yeah, really good school, kind of on par with like Wake Forest or Vanderbilt. It's called Furman. It's in South Carolina. Oh, sure. Um, anyway, I studied literature and philosophy, double majored, and um, you know, I've kind of been ever since I was a kid that annoying person that just always asks why. Uh, I have. A terrible time doing things that don't make sense from the life perspective. <laughs> that sounds uh, familiar. Yeah, I can identify. Uh, I've, uh, yeah, I've often been not the most ideal employee. Uh, because <laughs> Gosh, no, so really much. sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so much of employment is because I said so, and uh, yeah, that just the work right. for me, not my parents. So right. Um, anyway, that's that's, and I've always been really intentional um, because of that. You know, kind mm -hmm. of those go hand in hand. So. So I chose, you know, uh, like I said, a life of experience. After school, I traveled, backpacked around Europe for eight, nine months. Uh, most of that was solo. That was a crazy experience. Yeah, I moved to New York for almost three years. Started in retail, working for Ralph Lauren, kind of worked my way up to, you know, interior design or the merchandising, interior design side of things. Worked for another designer, uh, doing some of that. And then uh, went to Africa, got burnt out on... Oh, wow. um, yeah, I got burnt out on New York. I got mm -hmm. burnt out on fashion. I realized that I loved style. Style mm -hmm. pervades all manner of living, all facets of life okay. and industries. But fashion is vain, self-absorbed. Uh, it's just a, a yeah. kind of a grotesque world. Um, there's cool elements of it, but not for me. So I wanted to do something that wasn't so kind of self-centered and, and materialistic. And um, I yeah, moved to Africa and started working in an orphanage. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, in my construction, too, I, I worked – a framing crew uh, in summers. So that was kind of my first hands-on experience with construction and carpentry. And um, yeah, and I did a lot of building in the Africa experience, but that was, you know, every adjective you could conjure and then some. Oh, bet, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as and then I, I moved to, wound up moving to Chicago on a whim for six years. So, and then a lot of travel to different countries and cities in between all that. Um, I just, I'm very, to me, the, the thing that one of the most interesting things about life and certainly our species is our differences, right? Mm -hmm. Differences, cultural differences, differences in food and style and architecture. Um, I, I just do not like the monotony of the same thing all the time. I'm, you know, I get bored easily, but I'm also deeply curious. So mm -hmm. all those things really inform me. I saw a lot of different architecture, a lot of different, so many different styles and manners of doing things and I, a lot stayed in a lot of small spaces and so um that was my the, i just had a lot of experience in small space right mm -hmm. so that really informed a lot of my aesthetic and broadened my imagination for what's possible in space and i've always been my mom is kind of an interior designer so i've always been really drawn to space right mm -hmm. yeah um i'm a big nature person i'm a extreme. I want a good city or I want nature and yeah. I bore anything in between. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I could go on forever, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's enough of a background, I think. So with a philosophy degree, 
I'm assuming that, okay, this is an assumption. I understand. But okay. living in Africa, maybe you were exposed to living in a simple way that's maybe a little bit outside of what the American experience is. Um, talk to me about a philosophy of simplicity. What does that look like to you? Yeah, sure. Great question. So uh, start broad. To me, the tiny house movement is a philosophy, first and foremost, yes. right? Yeah. And it's not tiny homes on wheels. It's mm -hmm. so, there's so many different ways to embody that. And I mean, to me, home is one place. It begins mm -hmm. and ends one place, and that's here. Here, here is gotcha. Here is gotcha. You don't feel at home here. No space on the planet. Oh, preach. Feel at home. So, yeah, absolutely. And that's hard work. And uh, especially for someone like me who has a very unquiet mind that's racing, it's hard work. It's a, it's a life's journey. I mean, life yeah. is a process. There's never an arrival. Even death is a process of decomposition and reattributing your molecules into the into the yeah absolutely world, you know? um so to me what i've learned is is that uh if we're intentional with the constraints we place in our lives it frees up a lot of mental and emotional energy interesting um, mm -hmm. to focus on other things instead of the decisions we have to make all all day every day i, I mean decision fatigue especially as a, a decision maker and an entrepreneur or a creative yep. person or, or a leader in some form or fashion decision fatigue is real yes I mean, it is absolutely it is found in what i've had to teach myself it, it, you know I, there's a, a phrase that I, I try to make a mantra is discipline equals freedom and gotcha. yeah uh again if you if you give yourself constraints of a schedule or you limit uh kind of the opportunities for distraction in mm -hmm. your life um, and I think scheduling is a big thing. I think, you know, cutting out, uh, you know, dieting can be really good. Um, exercise can be really good. You know, keeping a regimen. Morning routine is, is awesome because you start the day out with a win. You, mm -hmm. you set it up, you kind of time it out and you give yourself, you know, I, I have, you know, I make my tea or coffee. I meditate. I journal. I do some little exercises and, and flexibility things. I spend 10 minutes reading something interesting or engaging or, or a business book. Um, and, you know, and then I, I don't know, I'll give myself, you know, a few minutes for some other thing, a breathing room, but it's worth getting up that extra time to give myself 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. Um, Cause my day starts off. I own that. Mm -hmm. I create the atmosphere. I set the tone for myself yeah. mentally, emotionally. Um, and it's a win. I've, mm -hmm. I've been productive right away. So uh, it really helps. It really, yeah, I really strongly recommend a good morning routine. Um, and then again, like giving yourself these, these constraints, like dieting, you know, it's hard. It, it requires discipline. It requires sacrifice. I feel so much better. Like, yeah. yeah, looking better or whatever, that's a residual, but that's not why. The mm -hmm. why is that you feel better. You have more energy. You're just like more vibrant. You know, you're, you're healthy, you have longevity. I and mean, the same with exercise, so much more energized. It's a great stress relief release. And these things require discipline, they require sacrifice. But again, I find those things freeing mm -hmm. it's coming from somebody who hates those things, right? I hate <laughs> these things. So, um, you know, it's the great irony of, of following some of the things your parents teach you and <laughs> or ah. your, your teach you and, um, you know, rolling your eyes at, at the fact that they were right on about some things. So. Oh, that's frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so do you live tiny? Tell me about your uh, current living situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good question. So the Alpha, the very first one I, I built or designed and built, I built a couple actually tumbleweed models to kind of get some experience. In the, you know, they, they build quality of quality designs and kind of learn what I, what I liked and what worked and what I wanted to change like Africa, all these different experiences. I, I have lived tiny in, in these different ways and simply I like camping a lot, backpacking. And um, so I did, I did, anyway, cart, me, my, my partner gave me carte blanche to like, he was like, well, I've, I've been building for 10 years and never had an HGTV opportunity. But let's make the coolest tiny house possible. So that was the, cool. end, like we didn't, we weren't like, okay, we have a budget. It was like, sure. his name is Zach Thomas, by the way, amazing human being. Um, one of the smartest people I know too, but we, we were just like, you know, he invested in, in provided that, that opportunity. And we we're just like, let's make the coolest tiny house possible. And so we felt like we did at the time. Um, you know, I, I kind of had some regrets about the alpha name, but that's an internal thing you do for your original model for a lot of products. It doesn't matter what it is. And we were like, 
at the time like wait there's just not another tiny house that has all these cool things so we'll just name it the alpha <laughs> anyway there you a go. little, little cubistic <laughs> unintentional um but yeah so I, I lived in that for about a year um we wound up selling it to disney uh wow little, cool little, i put it at a tiny house hotel for a while and look at mountain and then sold it to disney it was then given to we, we presented it live at the new world trade center on good morning america oh, and it was cool. presented and given to a family who lost everything in one of the wildfires oh, in California. Wow. so that was kind of a no-brainer uh and then since then because i live in nashville because of kind of the ways my business has taken me and, and evolved um i do live in, in about 800 square feet uh and um yeah i mean i i really like it like to me it's funny because people are like Oh, you're one of those hypocrites. It doesn't live in a tiny house. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you poor. <laughs> I mean, well, I don't live in a tiny house anymore either, but I have taken what I've learned from living tiny into my medium sized house. We live in 660 square feet now. Oh, beautiful. And there's no shame in that. I think it's, it's not. for some people, living tiny is a stepping stone to something. Absolutely. And for some people, it's an end in themselves. And there's, there's really not a need to judge one way or the other. 100%. Anybody can do whatever, yeah, you know? Uh -huh. 100% agree. I'm not proselytizing or telling people you need to do this. And I, again, yeah. what we both established is tiny, tiny living is a philosophy and it's a mentality it and you can do it anywhere. And, you know, um, maybe not a 35,000 square foot mansion in Beverly Hills, but most anywhere you can do it. I, so, yeah, I mean, I, again, like I don't judge, I don't tell, I'm not prescriptive. Uh, mm -hmm. I urge people not to be too, because it just like, it's bad energy for you and it doesn't right. do anything good or right. it motivate anybody to, to turn to the advantages and benefits of tiny living. So anyway. Well, actually it's a funny thing. Um, I have, we had left the tiny house for a couple of years before I realized it wasn't the tiny house that changed my life. It was simplicity. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that was this huge aha moment for me that I hadn't got in the three and a half years I lived in a tiny house. <laughs> and it's funny how hindsight will do things like that for you. That simplicity is really the goal and the aim here. It's not the house. There's nothing magic about the house, although maybe the orchid has a little magic. I mean, let's face it. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, I, the lighting in there is, is really magical. I mean, I mean, I'm obsessed with space. I definitely think yeah. there's value in, in space and small, small living. But mm -hmm. yeah. But kudos to you for, for having that experience and kind of coming to those conclusions with action, with the way you live. And you, you took action, you took risks to try these things and experience these yes. things. And, yes. Um, it sounds like. And that's you, liberating. That is liberating. Absolutely. It's, Absolutely. It's yeah. Failure it doesn't work out how you think it is, which most things in life don't. Right. Uh, you know, there's, there's valuable lessons that you learned that you might not yes. have if you didn't take those risks and, and try things out, you know, that you weren't, that you've never done before. Yeah. I love the phrase on your website, downsize to upgrade. <laughs> That's beautiful because so, I think so many people who are living in the normal house are enjoying a house that is normal and they're missing out really cool features. They're missing out things that are normally associated with luxury living, but they've tr made the trade-off. Um, and I know how judgmental this sounds, but often we're faced with the, with the trade-off of space, cheap, easy space yeah. and the beauty of uh, the work that you're doing with new frontier tiny homes is that it really is an upgrade the Thank space you. may not be there but the upgrade is so totally there and i think that environment of beauty is and i, I love how you said it it's um something you may catch or feel mm -hmm. but maybe not understand the details that are went into making that sure. and i think that's that's really interesting because Seriously. you are creating as much of uh, experience as you're creating a home. Sure, and that's I, really cool. That's really cool. Thank yeah. you. Can I, can I hit on that? Absolutely. <laughs> I realized there wasn't a question in there. There was intended oh, no, no, to be a question in there. Conversation. <laughs> not like conversation. Yeah. Not yeah. All, yeah. <laughs> we're riffing on each other, which means we're having an enjoyable conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so to that end, like, again, this is the intentionality and, and I, do most everything I do is with intention, even if it's unconscious. It mm -hmm. drives me crazy. I can't like just do something and not analyze the damn thing. But, <laughs> but, but with, with that, I mean, you know, let's talk about standard real estate, right? Uh, price per square foot is the metric that, that is universally right. establishes value. 
that metric does not serve clients. It does not serve you as a buyer. It yeah. serves the industry. It serves real estate agents and it serves builders and developers because most of the cost of the home, so much of the cost of homes is concentrated in kitchens and baths. Yeah. And some of these homes that have, some of these places in the house that have all these, these features and appliances and, and more expensive things. Uh, you add a bunch of rooms and you get a better price per square foot. The overall price gets jacked up, but your better price per square foot. Good job. You're, you're establishing <laughs> value. And you wind up adding a bunch of rooms that you don't use that we right. all inevitably fill up with shit that we don't need. You know, so exactly. You don't need. Um, exactly. But, and that's just the habit. And that's true for anybody. You have space. You're, you're almost, unless you're kind of a natural, minimal, vigilant minimalist, you're just going to fill it up with stuff. I mean, it's right. just kind of natural human human behavior and that's mm -hmm. that's kind of an evolutionary you know evolutionary thing so um for me it's kind of a marie kondo philosophy it's like love everything in your home love everything in your home and my price per square foot is obscene but what you have is you have all the functionalities of a full-size home mm -hmm. love everything in the home yes and it's beautiful and it's inspiring yeah. and it's what you need and it's tailored to your needs and you just feel the sense of pride and ownership about every detail. It's not, you know, again, I know you, of course you can get a full size home and land for the price of my, my homes. If that's what you want, buy that. Right. I'm right. not telling you to buy a tiny house. I'm not guilting you. I'm not saying, Oh, you need this. I'm saying you need whatever the hell you want. You need whatever you need. I don't know. And I'll never yeah. tell you. what you need. Yeah. You know? anyway. However, if elegance and refinement are your thing, <laughs> over space right <laughs> then um, love functionality and those things marriage. yeah i mean <laughs> and that's a that is a luxury that refinement that elegance of design that most people sure. don't get even with a high-end price price tag on the house and yeah. isn't it fun that in a tiny package you can have some of that Cheers. that's well, really cool i appreciate that um somebody who is looking around at their lives they've got way too much stuff they're not experiencing refinement and beauty and those things that they know exist and shouldn't cost a fortune um and they're overwhelmed with all the stuff they want to be free they want to experience a different way of living where do they start what would you say to them what's the first step that's a great question um so i actually it's kind of like a counterintuitive starting place i would because because we're, we are, I mean, we're slaves. And I'm talking to myself first. We're slaves to convenience, right? Yes. And we have all these inputs in our lives. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's incomprehensible 25 years ago, all the like, inputs we have in our lives, you know? Um, and it's overwhelming. And mm -hmm. we're always being, we're always being messaged, you know, a lot of, a lot of it's unconsciously, especially with social media and yeah. internet and. Um, it's noisy. Yeah, it's so noisy, and, it, and it, the message is very constant. It's you're lacking something. Mm -hmm. and if you buy this, or if yeah. you do this, then you have a solution. You can be whole. You can be complete. You can be enough. Yes. You're just missing this one thing. But if you have it, you will be enough. Yeah. And it's easy to get caught up in that, and it's easy to be. Uh, we've de we developed this unconscious habit of like, I have a negative feeling, and I I get this hit of dopamine or serotonin or whatever whatever it is, if I buy this cool thing that makes me feel good temporarily. Yeah. And it's this insatiable appetite's never satisfied, right? Yeah. And we wind up buying all these things that we may use once or, and it's like, oh, it's, it's a deal. It's mm -hmm. 20 bucks. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. it's, you know, the, and that is on the scale of the planet catastrophic. That, that is catastrophic. And, and more importantly for all of us as individuals, because all we can control really is our responses to the stimuli in our lives, mm -hmm comes naturally from within us we can't we really have these delusions of control and none of us has control over how we how we respond to how we're responding um yeah. innately so so i think what what i've what i've so what i what i really recommend is to start tracking it's it's simple keep your uh transition to simplicity simple because it's daunting and it can be overwhelming yes. but yeah I, I would i would inventory start to inventory the things that you have and start to kind of check and track real simply. I'm talking about one word, I'm talking about a bullet point. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. a, a novella or a paragraph. Mm -hmm. Start to track kind of the way you buy things. And when you, when you want to buy things or when you want to jump on social media, pause, take a deep breath and say, what's happening? What mm -hmm. is making me need to do that to feel better about right. myself? And I don't do this perfectly. I'm, not, I'm 
I'm talking about to myself. I'm not mm -hmm. talking at anybody uh, when I say this. Um, but but that that's a big thing. And then the Marie Kondo, I think that that one simple philosophy is so fundamental. If it doesn't bring you joy, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's it's really I think to me it's really fundamental to to be really intentional. Like if this thing, if I don't use it, if I haven't used it in a year, I say even like if I haven't used it in three months, unless it's a seasonal yeah. thing, yeah. get rid of it. And here's part of the tough part, but this also will deeply ingrain and change your habit of consumption is don't be like, oh, I need to sell it. I need to try to make claw back some of the money that I spent on it. Right. You'll never get rid of it. I, yeah. I do. I've done that. I continue to do that. It's like, I never get rid of a damn thing. Give mm -hmm. it away. Don't yeah. throw it away. Do yes. not throw it away. Yes, throw yes, away. yes. And don't, don't even try to keep a receipt for write-offs from Goodwill. Just go yes. put it for Big Ben and Let say, thank it you go. for your job. Thank you for doing the work you're doing. Somebody else will enjoy this more than yes. I did. Or yeah. they'll recycle it to somebody else who eventually enjoys it more than all of us did. <laughs> so um, that those are huge things. Is like really yeah. kind of cataloging your habits um, and the compulsiveness, trying mm -hmm. to find why we're doing those things, and then yeah. just get rid of it. Just get rid of it. So yeah. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. I think you hit on some really interesting points. Uh, one is all of marketing seems to be based on either fear that I'm not enough, or and that whole idea that I'm not enough is shame. Yeah. So if we're making uh, consumption choices out of fear and shame, we're going to wind up with a lot of crap. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not going to do what we think it's supposed to do. It's not going to make us somebody we're not. Yeah. You know, the, the name brand can't make me somebody I'm not today. I can't buy a car and make it and have that car make me somebody that I'm not today. Yeah. Um, I can't even buy a person have it make me somebody. <laughs> And I'm a woman and that's supposed to be ground rules. You know, those are supposed to be foundational. But I really appreciate what you're saying is that if you can, if you can listen to the marketing messages and something in your set, your head says, oh no, <laughs> oh no, not accepting that. Sure. Then that really is a way to begin right here. Like you said, this is home right here. Um, and that seems so well, duh. But gosh, that's, that's foundational to what we're trying to do here. Simplicity yeah. starts right here. Yeah. And fear and shame, that's one of the first things that we need to downsize. <laughs> well said. Well you know? Said. Love it. You're well yeah. said. I mean, the, but the philosophy thing is like, I'm not an academic philosopher. Sure, I've studied academic philosophy, but I'm sure. an armchair philosopher. And to me, yeah. a philosopher is anybody who asks why a lot. Yeah. He's yeah. deeply curious and asks questions. And I mean, the, the founder of, you know, of, of Western philosophy, Socrates, what was his thing? What was his thing? He asked questions. He did yeah. not have a lot of like declarative sentences. He asked a lot oh, of interesting. questions. Most of those things are not answered. So okay. I think it's that sense of curiosity and, and inquisition that really determines the philosopher. And you are a philosopher. You know, it, it's, not, it's not this pretentious I have a degree. I you don't have, have to have a long floor. beard. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I listened to classical music as, this morning as I read, you know, the treatise of blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> right. You don't, you don't need that stuff. I mean, honestly, I think academia, academia is so increasingly disconnected from the reality of the real world at school is, you know, um, that it's, it needs to change and mm -hmm. it's a yeah. bummer like the the pretense of knowledge the pretentiousness of knowledge uh is a real tragedy and it's it's ultimately a hypocrisy right and I interesting think, uh, i think if we're not trying to share what we know we're ultimately doing a disservice uh to our our fellow humans and yeah. you know yeah. it's uh it's not easy to do and you know we still got to sell stuff and make a living and all that but right but yeah, I mean, I, th I think ultimately, if you're adding value, ultimately, if you're adding value to people's lives, you're, you're succeeding. And I think it, it may not work in a particular job or business or industry. Eventually, you will be successful and you'll be able to survive and live the lifestyle you want. Yeah. Um, I just think if, that, if that's your intention is to add value to people's lives above mm -hmm. like, trying to capture value, because you've got to capture value. But I, th I think you're going to be okay. You know? so. And again, that's coming back to right here. Yeah. I mean, this is home. This is a place that we control what happens here. 
<laughs> and then what comes out of that? Do we serve humanity or are we takers? Are we always trying to take something? Sure. Um, that's, um, that's what I'm hearing you say. And I sure. think that's fantastic because when we live and work in a, in a serving um, mindset, if you will, uh, life feels a little bit different than being a taker. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it, there's, it's a little bit easier to be at peace with that kind of thing when you know you're actually working really hard to help other people uh, learn what you're trying to learn yourself. You know, everything you learn, pass along kind of thing. I, I love so, that. Cool. I love that. And I, I love like what you're doing because what you're doing is a service. You're, yeah. you're a platform to shine a light on different people and give, give people, your, your viewers, your listeners, uh, perspective and, mm -hmm. and you know, ideas and introduce them to to things that they may not have found on their own and so that's, yeah. that's cool i have a lot of respect for what you're doing and people like yourself so thank you cool thank you so much yeah. i mean you're getting to work in projects that are really close to your heart i think that's what i'm hearing and what you're saying is that sure. does that yeah. sound right yeah 100 yeah. percent um yeah. yeah i learned that the hard way that uh if i don't if i don't live from a place that i believe in uh, yeah I just, i'm happy and i'm not i not a good friend or colleague yeah. or employer. It's or hard. Whatever. Yeah. And I'd, I'd rather, I mean, starting a business is incredibly difficult. Starting mm -hmm. a business in which your product is pretty much illegal, unfinanceable, and not a narcotic. <laughs> Ooh, another <laughs> level of frustration. But, but it, <laughs> That's a tiny house. Illegal. Say it again. Illegal what? Illegal, unfinanceable, not a narcotic. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You're such a oh. dealer, you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so, yeah, but, but I, yeah, just, you know, we, we got it, we, we're taught, you know, anyway, this is a tangent, but kind of this, this will tie into the, uh, the, how is living simply changing my life positively, but we're taught, you know, you can do anything, dream, you can become anything, it's not true, it's just absolutely, <laughs> yeah. false. Yeah. and I'm a dreamer, and I'm a creative, so I'm like, sweet, I can do anything, you know, we grew up on movies, we grew up on these you know, invented narratives and we're taught to believe that we can do them and it's absolutely false. But what you can do is you can choose to move and to do, the, make the sacrifices and work yes. towards the lifestyle that you want. Yes. All of us can do yes. that, right? Yes, it's absolutely. It's a great sacrifice. It yeah. It's not going to be as ideal as you think. It's going right. to provide challenges that you never expected, but it's also going to provide joys and, and benefits and exciting things that you never could have anticipated or expected. Yeah. And the journey of that is so fulfilling mm. that I, I think self-respect is one of the most important things that I've oh, learned yes. I, that's, that's fundamental to my own happiness and then in turn, my ability to add the most value to people in my life. And, um, and, and yeah, so I think really following what, what you believe in is so important. And yeah, you may make not very much money or yeah, you may whatever. Uh, and you've got to balance that. You've got to survive. Right. You've got to take care of yourself. And sometimes yep. you've got to have a boring job that pays you what you need for five years, three years, one year to then live the lifestyle you want. So I'm not telling somebody, give up what you want and do, you know, give up what you're doing and go, you know, meditate on a beach for the rest of your life. I mean, you, you know, we all got to find our way. But I would mm -hmm. say, ultimately, keep trying to check in here. What your intuition is mm -hmm. telling you. Balance that with this. Yep. Balance it with the, with the, the necessary things of survival. Um, but keep checking in here and keep moving towards that. Keep, uh, Rumi talks about your inner wakefulness. And I love that as mm. a poetic description of, of intuition, right? Which I think should be all of our North Star. Um, so cool. we'll have, which is yeah. uh, anyway, yeah. Cool. So, so living simply, how has it helped my life? It, it's freed up energy and time. Mm -hmm. And focus. Uh, and focus to... Yeah to give me energy, time, and focus to, to, uh, to spend on the things that matter most to me, you know, yeah. like the experiences and the relationships in my life. So, you know, it, and it's a forever process. Like there are ways that I fail miserably at living simply. There are ways that I continue to struggle that are really hard for me. Um, but I keep trying, right. Yeah. And I keep working at it and I can keep experiencing the, the joys and the freedoms that it provides when it, as I continue to work at it. So yeah. that's what I'd, I'd recommend to anybody. Like if you hear anything I say is like, it, it's never going to get there. You're never going to arrive. It's never going to be, it's not this like magical thing that all of a sudden you're living simply and all your problems are solved. There, that doesn't exist in the world. Nothing will ever <laughs> provide that by the way, ever. <laughs> right. Uh, but, 
but it, it is it's the journey, it's the process of it that really has been so risk, enriching and challenging it in the right ways, right? In the fulfilling Absolutely. ways, growth, growth here and here that is so important for us. So, cool. Yeah. There are a number of really great takeaways from this conversation. First of all, the tiny house, it begins within. I know you can't really see on the podcast that we're making this motion. <laughs> we're make, it, it all starts here, and we're, we're giving you this motion that you can't really see on the podcast. But I, I guess the only way I can interpret or I can put words to that motion is that, that the tiny house starts within. It is a state of being. Simplicity is a state of being. So accepting constraints and sacrifices in order to get to the place we want to be. And again, that's a place of being. And if you want to call it happiness or contentment or shalom or whatever your word of choice is, I, this this conversation today was all about that, <laughs> creating that place that we want to be, a state of being. So thank you so much, David, for being with us today. Find David at New Frontier Tiny Homes. Find him on social media. I think he's probably up to something very interesting right now. It may not have anything to do with tiny houses. So make sure you find him because he's a really interesting person to follow. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. You can follow me on Instagram at Carmen Rose Shank. You can subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Please do. And you can download us on iTunes. The music is composed by William Kirkpatrick, lyrics by Louisa Stead, arranged and performed by classical guitarist Jonathan Crispin. Show notes available at carmenshank.com.